Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Chris Popoff. Uh, Chris is a engineer from Alberta, I believe a mechanical engineer. Um, he is the president of a uh, engineering consultancy, which I'm going to get him to pronounce. Uh, I'm uh, what I, I say I'm a lapsed Ukrainian. Um, I have a hard time with uh, words with a lot of Y's in them. Um, but uh, Chris is also the co-founder of Terrestrial Energy and my guest today to chat about uh, Alberta. Um, some pretty uh, interesting news coming out today on the nuclear front um, and on the broader energy front as the Alberta grid finds itself uh, under some degree of strain with uh, uh, polar vortex, which has, I guess, swept uh, the middle part of this continent. So Chris, uh, welcome on the podcast. Perhaps you can uh, give us the pronunciation of your engineering consultancy. And uh, if you want to fill us in a tiny bit more on your background, it'd be great to get to know you a bit better. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me uh, on on the show, Chris. Huge fan and followed you right from the beginning and uh, one of your biggest cheerleaders. So it's a, a real treat and pleasure. Uh, my consultancy is called Syzygy Engineering Consultants. Uh, it was never really meant to be a, a public uh, brand, so I apologize for the mouthful that it is. And uh, I, I'd say the most relevant and uh, I guess biggest prior that I have that I'm, I'm most proud of uh, for the decoupled community is being a co-founder at Terrestrial Energy. I came to that by the way of my involvement in Alberta uh, as a oil sands uh, development engineer. Uh, and prior to that, I had about a decade or so of previous experience in conventional uh, oil and gas development extraction. So everything from the, the downhole up to the surface and had a a role where I, I had a bit of a wide ranging uh, set of duties to uh, have the different disciplines interact with one another in, in delivering a concept uh, of a project into licensing and then, and then production. So uh, my passion for nuclear started uh, in that crucible, so to speak, uh, seeing how much resource that we have as a province and the contributions we make to the to the country and the planet through producing them and, and marketing them to people who use them, but also in the tremendous amount of energy that we consume in, in doing that. And it was very plain to see early on in my uh, thermal oil sense career that uh, Alberta was going to run into a marketing uh, PR issue rather, rather quickly with the emission intensity related with uh, those operations and uh, thought to get ahead of it. So that was kind of my genesis um, into, into nuclear space in Western Canada. And other than that, I do a little bit of dabbling around uh, serial entrepreneurship in general. So inventing, starting companies up, acquiring small businesses, operating them and uh, doing that kind of thing. So thanks for having me on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you and you're planting a big seed because uh, certainly I think uh, myself and my listenership are um, very interested in, in understanding unconventional oil a bit better. Um, we've been chatting about peak cheap oil with a few different guests and some of the controversies around that. Um, so looking forward to a future episode with you to, to really deep dive and understand that better. Um, but for today, again, um, you know, I'm, this episode will be evergreen, I'm sure, in many respects, but uh, there is, I won't call it necessarily breaking news, but certainly I think you've been getting a lot of alerts on your cell phone, as many Albertans have, um, regarding this this cold snap and to please conserve electricity, the grid is under stress. So um, why don't you first, uh, you know, be a bit of a weatherman for us and tell us a little bit about uh, what's been happening in Alberta on that front. And let's use that to go into a bit of a, um, a bit of a deep dive uh, to better understand Alberta. I'm, I'm guilty of being one of those, uh, you know, Ontario-centric Central Canadians, despite having uh, wrangled horses out in Bragg Creek and up in the Yukon, uh, spent some some lovely time in the in Alberta. I love it deeply, but I I, I am Ontario-centric, I think, in this nuclear advocacy. So it's great to bring in that perspective. Um, so yeah, tell tell us what the weather's been like, and then let's talk about how the grid has been handling it, and you know how we've gotten to the point that we're at, and and then we'll jump into the nuclear announcement uh, at the halfway point or something like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll forgive you for uh, maybe your experience being uh, DiCaprio-esque uh, with your your adventures in, into Bragg Creek and horses as uh, Leo was famous for shooting uh, some of his movie The Revenant out here and got caught making uh, comments to to some media about uh, the phenomenon known as a Chinook. I love it. Uh, so we, <laughs> we, get, we get a lot of cold in Alberta, obviously being at our latitude – 
Uh, we're on the east side of vast mountain ranges in the, uh, the continent. Uh, so we, we enjoy many benefits uh, from that. But and one of them is the uh, interesting effect that during a cold snap, the southern part of the province can experience uh, these prolonged periods of very warm winds coming along and, and melting the snow. I believe the word translates roughly into snow eater Chinook. So um, I could be wrong on that. Uh, I might be buying into local myth because there are also salmon named after Chinooks and that phenomenon doesn't tend to happen where, where the salmon are. So <laughs> any, anyway, that's what it means to us. Uh, the Chinooks don't really uh, extend much beyond uh, the central portion of the province around Red Deer, if you're familiar with where we live. Uh, we also do not have tremendous uh, amounts of lakes in in and around our major population centers as uh, Toronto benefits from and places like Chicago. So we don't have lake effects, but we have other big effects like Chinook. And every once in a while, we get a disruption from uh, the polar vortex when it experiences a little bit of instability. And, uh, you know, I've lived here my whole life. So I, I usually expect to have about a week or two of very, very cold weather all the way down to the southern parts of the province, it gets as cold as minus 40 degrees Celsius. And that's where Celsius and Fahrenheit uh, tend to uh, overlap. <laughs> right. <laughs> no more conversion required. And with wind chills, um, you know, you can get into minus 50s uh, as it feels on the skin. So severely uh, hazardous and life-threatening for, for people to be in those kind of conditions. We'll stop working outdoors on, on uh, drilling rigs and completion rigs when it gets that cold. Um, but up to that, we, we try to push. And I think the, the thing that is really important to understand about that is that, um, you know, materials, buildings, cars, machines, everything, they, they're subject to a lot of, uh, extreme conditions in a very short amount of time in a place like Alberta, you can swing from a minus 40 centigrade sort of condition. And then if you get a Chinook blow through the next day, it's plus 20. Wow. So that's a 60 degree swing in a matter of 24 hours. And that happens enough <laughs> that it's not weird. And um, if you were a designer, an architect, an engineer, or, or someone that's contemplating putting a thing into these conditions, you've got to uh, account for those thermal stresses and what that means. Um, it tends to limit your material choices. Um, you're forced to build for those edge cases where the conditions are the most extreme so that they can continue operating. And that's really relevant for something as complex and important as an electric grid. Now, just, just more broadly, again, for the international audience, um, I think Albert, Alberta is pretty well known around the world. As you mentioned, Leo DiCaprio made it a little famous there, but uh, you got the beautiful Rockies, um, you have, uh, the oil sands, uh, yeah, I guess you had a lot of, uh, or a decent amount of conventional oil and gas. I mean, Alberta, um, has, uh, certainly some resentments towards central Canada because I think of the, uh, you know, our federal system and, and, uh, you know, there's this Western alienation because I think a lot of, uh, Alberta's wealth has, has gone to help out, uh, some of its, uh, provinces to the East. Um, but again, just want to get a, a slightly better sense because, you know, there's been commentary about how, you know, Albertans are being told to conserve energy, and this is one of the ener most energy-rich places in the world. So just very briefly, give us that energy context for Alberta. Um, you know, I understand that the, uh, the bitumen reserves are, are truly massive, not, not the easiest to access and quite energy-intensive to produce. But um, yeah, if you can just give us a quick little tourism Alberta take on, on sort of the underlying energy, and then we'll dive back into the grid side of things. Sure, and maybe, maybe we can get... Uh you know, more into specifics and, and a richer history yeah, uh, in future episodes when we definitely. go to treat that. Yeah. But um, broadly speaking, um, there, uh, Alberta's situated in a, in a place that at one point in time was a very vast um, sort of tropical ocean. And as that uh, evolved, geologically, pardon, um, it got uh, covered with sediment. We had very tremendous uh, coral reef structures uh, that were present akin to the Great Barrier Reef uh, as it exists today. But it, it gets buried with sediment. And then as the mountain ranges form, uh, they get sort of reorganized and pushed up into what we refer to as the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin broadly. 
And that's basically from the eastern slope of the, the Rocky Mountain Ranges and extends out into where it will eventually outcrop uh, to the surface onto the Canadian Shield as you extend through Saskatchewan and into Northwest Territories and so forth. So what happens is you get these little layers of sandstone uh, that form and, and get consolidated and you'll have various layers of clays that act as cap rocks for those formations. And that's sort of where conventional reservoirs are, are um, you know, produced and accessed. And most people would think of oil bearing formations as one of these sandstone type formations. So if you see a, a classic sort of building in uh, downtown Toronto or Chicago, and it's like that beautiful sandstone formation, it's pretty much exactly the same as that. Um, the carbonate reef that uh, exists is what we would have as more of your sort of textbook world grade uh, formation. These are the types of formations that tend to exist more in the Middle East. They're very large and prolific. They, um, they behave a bit differently, but the primary difference is one is like a sand cemented in place and then the other is like chalk. And um, where the oil sands are deposited are very near surface and in the sandstone type, but because it's somewhat young geologically and was not subject to a lot of depth and pressure from the overburden, they're uncemented. So you get these, uh, it's, it's more like a sandbox. If you hold it in your hand and massage it, it will break apart. And the, the bitumen actually acts as kind of a consolidating factor. It's kind of hard. It feels like a hockey puck at room temperature. So it needs to be encouraged to, to move like uh, conventional oil does. Um, Alberta has an abundance of uh, a selection of resource types, as well as a lot of some of those resource types. We traditionally uh, develop the conventional type resources sort of as a, a captured sort of state to American oil interests early in, in the development cycle. Uh, we could talk a lot about that. Um, so a lot of the capital and even the regulatory frameworks that set the stage for oil and gas development in the West were actually formulated by American minds, American interests, primarily to keep uh, already built or um plan to be built American refineries fed. And a lot of our resource tends to flow either south or southeast towards these major markets. And so Alberta has been more or less captive to a single customer for a majority of its uh, lifetime. And um, I think that's relevant for uh, this conversation because of some of the things you alluded to with attitudes of people in Alberta towards energy uh, a lot of um, identity gets tied to, uh, a sense of identity gets tied to being an oil worker at, or, or having family that's worked in oil and gas or agriculture is another popular sort of uh, feeling, farming. And it puts in place this resentment between Western Canada and Eastern Canada. I think it also speaks to the a, a difference between the two regions where one in the east, central Canada is, you know, primarily as Toronto goes, the rest of the country goes. And that's just the, the nature of demographics in a democracy. There's way more people out there. The institutions are way more mature and established. And it's where the government class, the bureaucratic class and the banking class resides. And they've been in cahoots for a very long time. And Western Canada has had little you know, periods of uh, increased importance over the past, but it's never really been able to be sustained. No, I think that's that's great context as well, because part of the story of, you know, moving back to the grid in Alberta is uh, federal interference there in terms of some of the goals of the current federal government uh, in regards to uh, some of, uh, you know, its, its climate and environmental goals of, for instance, a net zero grid uh, across the country by 2035. Um, which I think many in Alberta see as as not realistic and potentially even dangerous. And, and again, that brings us back to this current weather event. So you've done a great job, I think, of, of setting the table here uh, for the rest of our conversation. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about um, you know what makes up the Alberta grid. Um, 
I understand that uh, Alberta is almost all the way through a coal phase out, um, having largely shifted to natural gas. But there's certainly been um, some large additions of, of uh, so-called renewable energies, wind and solar. Um, so maybe you can sort of give us a quick overview of, of that current grid makeup before we start talking again into some of the politics of, uh, of, uh, of federalism um, uh, as it pertains to kind of evolving energy conversations and, and now this interest in nuclear. But for now, tell us about the Alberta grid. Sure. Um, the Alberta grid, uh, as it evolved, it, it sort of evolved in lockstep with um, oil and gas infrastructure development. When people talk about grids, there's a, a focus, uh, perhaps rightfully so, on, on just the electric grid. Um, however, in, in Alberta, it's quite relevant to discuss um, the fossil fuel grid. I, I sort of refer to it as the thermal grid, um, more or less due to the fact that natural gas gets utilized for space heating and in furnace heating for industrial uses. And I mean, that's a traditional use. It's getting to be adopted more and more as uh, an electricity generation fuel um, for a number of reasons. But tr conventionally, Alberta's grid was developed as uh, around large centralized but remote coal-fired power stations, primarily in the northwestern portion of the province. So just west of Edmonton region, more or less, and in around Edmonton, with some uh, extending further east and south. And for a long time, the major municipality of Edmonton and Calgary were kind of on separate grids. And that's been uh, connected recently. We also have, and that was largely on the back of the, the emergence of an over and over abundant supply of electricity from gas-fired cogeneration from the oil sands. So you had a situation where in the Fort McMurray region, where most of the uh, oil sand deposits exist, a lot of producers were, were getting more and more into putting cogeneration on their facilities for uh, their own operation, but also to add another stream of revenue to their business on top of oil and gas sales that would sell electricity. And that was just putting too much supply onto the northern grid and the lack of inner ties into British Columbia or, or Saskatchewan left it with no place to go. And it's not exactly something that's easy to curtail when it's coming from an industrial operation that's running 24-7. Uh, so there, there was investment made to increase the inner ties and the connections between the north and south. And the south also connects into uh, Montana. So over time, as uh, the Harper government enacted some regulations to retire coal-fired power, um, Alberta and its generate, generation owners uh, made motions to, to begin shutting them down. Uh, Rachel Notley's NDP accelerated that transition by uh, encouraging, uh, for a lack of a better word, uh, those, those generators to take an option to retire early and that really set off uh, repowering projects that mostly utilize the existing plant infrastructure, the personnel, et cetera, into gas-fired turbines as opposed to coal-fired turbines. We have pretty limited uh, coal capacity remaining, um, but that transition will be more or less complete uh, before, before the end of the decade here. Um, it's important to note too that when those decisions were made, those turbines were selected to also allow for um, flexible fuel in a sense of being able to use natural gas with increasing amounts of hydrogen blend in it because there is quite a motion afoot as well for Alberta to, to leverage its resource um, abundance in producing just hydrogen. And, and that's... Uh, one of the proposed sort of uh, alternatives that that there's a lot of proponents for. I personally feel there's there's severe limitations around hydrogen, as well as renewables that we need to be honest with ourselves about when we're actually uh, integrating them into our power supply. So that brings us, I guess, to I mean, first off, just one clarifying question: um, like, what percentage of El uh, Alberta's electricity generation is from these cogeneration plants? Um, and and I guess they're they're coming on maybe interrupting some of that industrial uh, heat supply work to sort of take advantage of high market prices on the grid, or are they kind of providing baseload or how, how does that work? 
Yeah, um, that's a great question. If you looked at the way the generation mix has changed over the last few decades, it was uh, you know strongly weighted towards coal and and natural gas. So you'll see commentary where eighty percent or greater of of electricity demand was satisfied by fossil fuels. And as the transition has occurred, it's still regarded as fossil fuel powered, but just less and less contribution from coal. If you look at the contribution from natural gas, uh, it is a mixture of natural gas and cogeneration. Um, that split is still primarily provided by um, the, the dedicated gas fire plants, but the cogeneration contribution is significant. And the, the way those plants are operated, um, they're serving their steam requirements first. The electricity production is a happy byproduct of that. Gotcha. So um, the decisions that get made to, to run cogen or not are mostly affected by the steam schedule and, and not very affected by what whatever the grid is um, requesting or, or offering in terms of uh, a price to to cogeneration producers. Okay, so let's let's I guess cap off this discussion with the new kids on the block, and and that would be the uh, intermittent um, wind and solar that's that's been added. Um, you know, we had our experience here in Ontario with a pretty rapid deployment under the uh, Energy Venda Light uh, of uh, our Green Energy Act, um, which saw I think about five thousand megawatts of uh, wind added, and I get confused because there's a lot of behind the meter solar, but I think in total. And I go on a limb here and say about three gigawatts of solar in Ontario. Um, that was uh, a little before I think Alberta's sort of great renewables build outs. Um, there's now a moratorium on um, new wind and solar in Alberta. Um, so, you know, lots to discuss here, but but yeah, catch us up a little bit on on the uh, the wind and solar side of things or the renewable side of things in Alberta. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the one of the other famous or claims to fame for Alberta is that we're actually one of the sunniest places on earth uh, year round, despite our cold weather. Uh, we do have a, a tremendous amount of sunlight hours as a resource. Our high latitude um, means that the strength of that solar resource isn't, um, you know, as uh, prolific as somewhere in Arizona. But the the amount that we get, it honestly makes our winters bearable to have them yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and and we also have some corridors that are also quite windy. And uh, again, the benefit of, of the mountains. So if you've ever been through uh, that corridor between Los Angeles to Palm Springs, you get this wind tunnel sort of effect. And we, we have smaller versions of that in different places in the province. Uh, famously, most famously in the uh, sort of eastern slopes uh, region in, in the southeast portion of the province. So um, prolific and abundant and absolutely uh, when you live in a, a free market like Alberta, where uh, investment is encouraged and entrepreneurship is encouraged, um, you'll see a lot of capital coming in and chasing these opportunities. And then it's it's sort of up to the rest of the system to to integrate them. We, we're in a, an energy only market, so generation is deregulated. And that is done to allow for competition to occur on the generation side. The distribution, the, so the the wires portion of it and the delivery is regulated. So it's a, an interesting sort of mix. And it's very uh, difficult to talk about energy sometimes with people that aren't necessarily in the space or they have a, a strong bias one way or another because, uh, you know, you can see their their bias is showing based on how they, they represent the conversation. But, you know, cheap wind and solar... Uh, doesn't always mean quality and cheap may only mean cheap to the person who's making the investment decision for generation only, which means their area of concern ends at the, the edge of their property. It is not extended to the end consumer. Um, I think the other thing that's important for people to understand, we talk a lot about the energy grid and cleaning that up, uh, the electric grid, but Electricity is only 7% of our end use consumption in this province. Um, we have about a 12 gigawatt grid, so respectable, um, modern, but a tiny fraction of the total energy that we consume 
as a province. A lot more goes into combustion for generating steam for our oil sands production, running petrochemical plants, refineries, and things of that nature, and then taking natural gas liquids and condensates in kind and either blending them with our bitumen or using them as a source of hydrogen to upgrade the, the bitumen into a higher energy product. And that's what I refer to as energetic subsidization of our product. And so when you look at Alberta's energy consumption and their demand profile, um, we're being either dishonest with ourselves about where the real work needs to be done, or we're just over, we're buying into the discussion about the electric grid and uh, I don't know, we're both missing opportunities and, and maybe putting our, our efforts in, into the wrong area. Personally, that's my opinion. Maybe remind me, remind me where we started with that question. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's good. That's totally I wanted good. to make that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a great point. Um, in Ontario, um, you know, we have the lake effect, uh, which means that our wind in particular um, is most abundant in our shoulder seasons of spring and fall when our demand is actually at its lowest. So the capacity value, the value of that energy is is, is fairly low and uh, often displaces cheaper hydroelectricity. Um, so, you know, many of us think that it wasn't the greatest investment or certainly that we overinvested, built a little too much of it. Um and you know, new investments have petered out as the feed-in tariffs um, were were dropped. Um, but in Alberta, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, again that, that kind of capacity value of the resource? Um, is is wind pr- producing um, in sync with with demand? I mean, I know uh, I don't mean to ask too loaded of a question. I know certainly that uh, during this cold snap, um, wind in particular has has had a pretty egregious performance. Can you can you walk us through um, again tying things back into your current sort of weather reality? Yeah, sure. Um, in in extreme conditions like this, I, I refer to them as edge cases. These are what system designers and planners, um, you know, stay up at night thinking about. Uh, wind and solar are somewhat predictable, and you can think about them in terms of being able to be there through seasons. Um, you can look ahead with weather forecasts with you know, some reasonable amount of predictability. Um, but the fact is that every once in a while you get these extreme conditions that push it right to the edge. And it's no longer a matter of, you know, using averages or uh, saying you can just buckle down and, and get through it. Uh, wind is fairly steady in Alberta as an aggregate um, due to some of those wind tunnel type effects. Um, It does tend to blow a little bit uh, stronger in the evening past conventional sort of peak demand on the grid as well. Um, But again, you can't plan on it because it it won't necessarily be there, which means you need to to build out backup. You either need to have storage or you need to have redundancy in your grid. And that typically gets... um, considered when other large thermal plants get put on the grid, as in our first attempt, major serious attempt to bring nuclear into the province with um, Energy Alberta Corporation, and then eventually Bruce Power uh, found out they were proposing fairly large uh, reactor types at that point in time relative to the grid. And the system operator was concerned that if there was ever an event where that that uh, generation source tripped, uh, they wouldn't be able to make up a gigawatt worth of generation in the matter of moments. So the net effect of having, you know, four gigawatts worth of wind on the grid, and then all of a sudden it's not, it's a similar sort of problem, but because you build out these turbines a little bit at a time, 50 megawatts here, hundred megawatts there, um, they don't really get subject to the same level of scrutiny and, and questioning when having to um, account for that fallout or that trip condition, more or less, what is our backup? What is our redundancy? And when it happens randomly, more or less, uh, I mean, it it creates these severe conditions that the grid may actually fail to operate. And that puts you in a position where you're doing cold starts on thermal assets that may not have been running or they've uh, been shut down uh, just due to the grid being unable to take their supply. And if you're trying to do that in the middle of a minus 50 polar vortex storm with 
you know, precipitation on top of that, it, it can be absolutely awful. And uh, you may not get up. And then you're looking at a, a truly dire situation where uh, harm to, to people and, and property are, are really severe. Um, I don't want to ever see that happen. I don't think anybody does. And that's really where we need to be coming from when we're having these conversations and, and not trying to, uh, you know, pitch our preferred solution more or less or, or to promote the talking points of whatever political uh, group that we, we are subscribed to at the moment. Um, it should be noted, too, that gas is subject to, I mean, everything fails in, in conditions that extreme. Uh, the oil and gas industry in Alberta obviously has learned a lot of lessons from that. We we do a lot of cold weather hardening or winterization. We use a lot of insulation on the pipelines. We do injection of uh, antifreeze, for lack of a better term, at points in the system where we know they're, they're more susceptible to hydrates or ice, gas, ice forming, um, which get uh, exacerbated with really, really extreme ambient conditions like that. You don't see that in other warmer climates where they do have major gas networks built, um, you know, uh, East Coast, uh, down into Texas. They don't go to the extent of uh, Alberta practices that it, when it comes to winterization. So we're not, we're more prepared for extreme conditions on the gas side, but we're not immune. And in this most recent example, there were two gas fire plants that were already down due to maintenance. Um, one, one was really just trying to get onto the grid to begin with. Uh, and the system operator doing all the math and all their homework thought, hey, we look good. We should be fine. But every once in a while, a little event like this comes along that you know, proves us wrong. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then we have to sc scramble to respond. And that's where that demand response came in. You know, there's there's obviously some echoes, I think, for U.S. listeners to uh, the Texas freeze. Um, I believe that's two years ago now, in 2021. Um, and there, um, the gas infrastructure was not as winterized or winterized. Um, the nuclear infrastructure, I, I believe there's a turbine haul or two that are just fully outdoors at their nuclear plants. Um, there was a, exactly. There was a trip at a nuclear station, but I think in terms of the capacity factors, weathering that storm, nuclear led the pack, and I think 80% capacity factor. Um, you know, gas lines froze. There was, uh, I guess, problems with supply. Coal piles froze, um, and the similarly, the wind, the wind fleet, um, and and solar fleet were were absent. Now they've made you know massive investments um, in in those technologies, and you know the champions of those technologies will say, hey, listen, we never promised we'd show up, um, so it's not our yeah. it's not our fault. But I mean, this does raise the question of of investment choices. Um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, with that idea of a large wind fleet um, acting like a very large nuclear plant or potentially several nuclear plants tied together. This, this idea, I think Meredith Angwin brought this up of a common mode failure. Um, and she was yeah. re referencing this idea of like a, you know, a twin engine jet or even a four engine jet and, you know, engineers really having to think through and deal with, you know, contingencies. And if all four jet engines go out on, on a, uh, A380 Airbus, uh, big, big problems, but, uh, in ways, you know, a, a system made up of, uh, you know, small modules, if they are all subject to the same stress or, or power source being the wind, they, they can go off quickly. So in any case, I, uh, this will probably tie right. us into, I guess, the the renewables moratorium that Alberta's uh, going under right now. Um, like, is this weather event like a vindication of that policy, given um, how the wind fleet, for instance, just has not shown up and, and not been of any assistance? You know, investing more in this resource, um, you know, while it may have some benefits in aggregate or in shoulder seasons or you know, in terms of sparing fossil fuels or lowering carbon intensity slightly, uh, is is this kind of why that decision was made in terms of how it was justified to the public? That is a that's a hot potato sort of question. Um, my personal opinions uh, definitely get me in hot water on on uh, <laughs> that topic, and uh, I'm not I'm not afraid to share them here. Um, I think there's there's a number of reasons that that decision got made. Uh, one of them is the theater of it. Of course, um, it helps the the party in power currently which is more or less a pro oil and gas party to uh back their base up and and to uh show support for the industry which is popular um whether it's accurate or not uh, so certainly i think that's a factor but leading up to the moratorium and that decision we were 
experiencing uh, many, many cycles of uh, that absenteeism, like you said, the, oh, well, we weren't counting on it. That is a very strange attitude if you're someone that designs these sorts of grids and has um, the concern for others and, and you know, factors like uptime and, and health factors uh, in your heart. Um, it's, I, it's sort of why I consider, I, I, I dub wind and solar narcissistic supply uh, because it's like, well, I'm going to show up when I feel like it. And when I'm here, I'm amazing. I'm the best. Uh, I'm the lowest carbon, I'm the cheapest and, uh, what you have criticisms of me? Well, they're not true. That's up to you to fix. That's a you problem. <laughs> That's a classic narcissist if you deal with people like that. So I, I look at that, uh, presence of wind and solar on a, on a grid or a society as as a sort of like an absentee dad or, a, you know, <laughs> just a real dick, <laughs> someone to deal with. And, and they're asking us to, to bend to their will. And I just find that is completely incompatible with modernity and the needs of a, a modern industrialized society. Um, and sure, it is possible to do the math, to contemplate the worst of worst case scenarios and say, okay, well, let's call it two weeks of no supply from wind or solar for whatever reason, terrible blizzards, ice storms, et cetera. Here's how many batteries you'll need to invest or one proposal that was out here was converting old coal mine sites in, in the uh, eastern slopes into pump hydro storage. We do not have tremendous hydro resources in Alberta at all. We have some pretty big rivers that have potential, but nothing like Ontario or Quebec. And here's a, a company that was proposing uh, some major buildouts of coal fired, or, or sorry, more, more coal mining that got roundly rejected by the, by the populace and was kind of redirected into taking that asset and then putting it into um, a pumped hydro storage that would work with local wind. Now, let's say we build all that out. The extreme event, that two week lull or a four day lull just like this, it doesn't come around that often. So you're building it for that just in case scenario. And if you're making an investment like that and it doesn't actually uh, run into this, the circumstance that it was built for, it's not going to recapture the the capital required because it's not selling anything. It's buying all this power and it's not putting it back to the grid. It's totally overbuilt. So then you have to make all these other mechanisms and negotiations and end up paying for things like capacity or availability and like creating all these little workarounds and new rules to find ways to get money into the hands of those developers or you develop it as a state and you just take losses and losses until one day, okay, it is needed and thank goodness it's there. So resolving those issues um, is a real problem. And we were seeing a lot of that effect going on on a smaller scale, even up until the moratorium. So I think the moratorium was uh, a factor uh, or affected by factors like that where we saw really low power prices when wind and solar were contributing. But that meant the gas-fired uh, companies weren't able to sell their supply. So they're, they're sitting on this underutilized asset. And when the grid was able to accept capacity from the gas-fired generators, they're sort of permitted to overcharge and make up the difference. There is uh, a legal limit to how much can be charged in Alberta. And there were just more and more hours being applied where uh, those generators were uh, doing a practice, what's called withholding and uh, economic withholding. So they have the ability to generate and supply the grid, but they're waiting until the price is a bit higher yeah, yeah. so that they can make up for all those times that they're not making any money. And that's their obligation and duty as, as a private corporation. That's their interest. And it, it really sets up these really strange games where we have things that are happening that are technically legal, morally gray, um, and you shouldn't expect a system that's uh, set up to optimize return of capital and profit maximization to do anything different. This is this is a dream scenario for someone that owns uh, sporadic generation and storage. They'll go and buy. The, the supply when it's being curtailed, essentially free or negative pricing, 
fill up their storage capacity, wait until they can capture the maximum allowable price. So a highly variable, unstable grid is a dream come true to renewable plus storage advocates. They will make a ton of money in this circumstance. And the people operating the grid and taking their supply from the grid, trying to run their businesses or social services on top of that, schools, hospitals, industrial uh, plants, production plants, what have you, they suffer deeply <laughs> from an unreliable random grid that they may or may not count on. They have people to pay, they have loans to repay, they have really expensive equipment to maintain that can't be subject to, mm, maybe I'll show up today. So so we joke here in Ontario, um, and this can get into our sort of central Western Canada rivalries as as uh, as, as real as the reasons behind them are, but as silly as they sometimes get, um, that, you know, Alberta electricity prices uh, have started to make our prices look good again. Um, we had a major cost escalation with our renewables build out um, for different reasons, I guess. Uh, we had these, you know, very um, generous, uh, to put it mildly, um, feed-in tariffs, 20-year uh, contracts, um, curtailment was paid for, um, you know, prices as high as 80 cents a kilowatt hour for, for solar. Uh, and I believe around 25 cents for wind, um, which, you know, when all is said and done, just the subsidies will have cost us $62 billion by the time the contracts expire. Um, we took that, uh, that burden off of the rate pair to some degree by shifting it to the tax base. And now it's, I think the seventh or eighth line item on our provincial budget is paying renewable subsidies. It's part of the renewables cost shift. I believe it's about $3.2 billion a year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what's been the impact of, uh, you know, the renewables penetration into an energy only market in Alberta? Have, have prices gone up, gone down? Um, is it as simple as that? Can you attribute price hikes to, um, to this, these additions or, or is it a more sort of complex story than I'm maybe painting it to be? No, it's, um, it's a, it's a repeating story, uh, Places like Germany and Ontario, California have run this experiment and uh, have applied different regulatory uh, frameworks and approaches and, and grid control approaches, lots of different complex, uh, you know, contract for difference or subsidization techniques. And it's great that we get to see this work in practice. But when you're looking at it at at the beginning of something and you're like modeling out and predicting what if scenarios and what could happen uh, type questions, it becomes pretty clear that this is what happens. <laughs> when, when you're having to build uh, a system, if your goal is to supply all of your demand with these low carbon, but highly variable and random supply sources that show up at random periods of time, um, you have to rebuild uh, the entire grid essentially as a backup, not just the generation, but the way it's delivered and moved and stored because power provision is not really a commodity in the classic sense. It's not like I'm buying a, a bundle of oranges and they can sit in the fridge in, in a cold storage warehouse or on a boat somewhere. Um, and they're totally fine months later for me. Power is, a space-time sort of phenomenon. It needs to show up at a very specific time and place and in a certain form to be able to do useful work. And uh, we don't really have a system that truly uh, appreciates that or allows uh, the average person to think about it in those terms, um, which is how you sort of get caught up into debates and, and biases around uh, you know picking sides. And it, the experience in Alberta is like anywhere else. As the contribution from variable resources has increased, the delivered price to consumers has also increased. And that uh, is sort of highlighted by the fact, is it because of the wind and solar or is it because of the gas generators withholding? And are the gas generators withholding because they're evil people or because that's what the regulations allow them to do? So it's the regulators fault. It, it's a ton of blame gaming, but the, the end result remains that if you have uh, a system that is trying to deliver uh, extremely high quality resource, like um, timely 
ability to do work for a number of completely random uses uh, of questionable uh, import. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but that's what modern life is. You know, having having access to clean, affor- affordable, reliable energy uh, to me should be uh, a human right in in modernity. We we don't have that for everyone, and the more uh, renewables we put on the grid for the masses, the the more that dream is challenged, uh, and we see that story repeating over and over again. So I I do think that that instability and that overall rising price environment was a major factor behind the moratorium. And I know there were complaints f- from rural consti- constituents that just opposed development of, of those resources on their land anyway. Um, that's a, another significant factor. But um, if, if we go back to your comment about Ontario's pricing looking better than Alberta's all of a sudden, well, that looks a lot like um, we're, we're losing out on opportunities to attract new business, um, to attract new... Uh, people moving into the province to to settle and establish a family here, um, and it's true. If if your availability, reliability, and price of power is expensive, it's no different than having an extremely high tax base because it's an input that goes into absolutely every activity that occurs in that economy. And it's regressive. Um, it's it's interesting looking at completely know, regressive. And and again, I think that's why. Um, we shifted uh, this expense over to the tax base uh, because, well, it's a, it's a progressive tax base. But let's leave that aside for a second. You know, beyond sure. beyond this, uh, I guess, kind of mantra that that wind and solar are the cheapest form of electricity lies. Uh, you know, these edge cases again when the system gets uh, very strained. Um, in Texas, um, there was, I believe, two hundred billion dollars in economic losses, not from a total, you know, uh, need to black start the grid, but just from these rolling uh, blacklists that they had. Um, more importantly, I think there were 2,000 lives lost. Um, I mean, this is highly consequential. Um, I'm struck in the discourse by how sort of fast and loose people are willing to play with the grid, um, you know, making assumptions about, you know, numbers of Tesla, you know, battery walls that will be able to float everything. And look, we've modeled it. And NREL's done the modeling. You know, the reality of what's happening in Alberta doesn't make sense compared to the model that we've we've developed. Um, you see some really bizarre stuff happening out there in the discourse. But um, this idea, um, and so far we we haven't, I think seen it uh, in the in the developed West, but we we tend to be teetering on it. There's warning signs, you know, f- and from a medical perspective, you know, the vital signs are off uh, when we're getting, um, you know, this kind of frequency of of grid strains and and grid alerts. Um, it's it's something that I don't know. I I, I find I find quite worrisome. Um, I'm not sure if that's really a question or something for you to riff off quickly, but um, that that idea of of you know what could what could have been done with the two hundred billion dollars that had to go into the economic losses that occurred in in Texas? What could that do for a society? Um, whether it's achieving climate goals or educating their population or paying for services like healthcare, um, it's a, a big open question. Um, but as these as the as the potential for these events becomes more likely, I mean, it's it's something that we should guard against. I think uh, you know with all all potential tools on the table. Yeah, um, I'll. I know it's not a question, but I'll, I'll reinforce your, your thinking and, and your, uh, your concern. Um, it is regressive. And the more we see these sorts of events, the more I believe it indicates uh, an overall degradation of, of the quality of our energy system and, and the quality of the resources that we're accessing. It ties into uh, some of the larger themes of your show too, with that peak cheap oil concept. Peak cheap oil really means um, high quality oil, and and something that you get a lot of bang for your buck out of. Uh, we are really out of that uh, phase of oil and gas development in in human civilization period globally. And Alberta is a very good microcosm of that with oil sands. It's an extremely low quality energy resource. We have a ton of it, but as I referred to earlier, we provide a tremendous amount of energetic subsidization by blending it with higher quality energy resources like gas liquids, um, combusting the gas that is available to insert hydrogen into it to even get it to surface in the first place. In, in the early sort of 
uh, phase of oil and gas development, you could kick the ground and you'd have a gusher in some places. So you would have, you know, 1500 barrels back for every barrel you put into uh, your exploration efforts. Uh, modern oil sands operations on average is something like three barrels for every one that we put in. So it's similar sort of ratios with wind and solar, just very low. And the more we have of those kind of low grade sources uh, contributing to the mix overall, the more the average comes down. And uh, the, the ability for the uh, very ener energetically abundant sources to pick up the slack uh, it degrades over time. So it, it's something deeply concerning to look at. And uh, the other theme that you touch on a lot in your show is innumeracy. We're really bad with big numbers, really bad as people. We're really bad with uh, looking at uh, rate of change if it's not a linear thing. And we're really bad at observing systems. Um, it's maybe one of the things I'm fortunate to see naturally without a ton of effort is, is how things connect and, and how things work on a systems level. And, you know, my um, hope and uh, reason for coming on shows and like this and, and doing public talks and doing the work I'm doing with nuclear is to try to educate uh, average person around how important this is for uh, our well-being, not just as individuals, but as as a healthy civilization on on planet Earth. Um, I, I've said this before to you, but we won't live to see the full uh, impacts of climate change if we allow our our energy provision to to keep degrading like this, um, and and really putting our our bets behind low quality, uh, high high entropy. Uh, energy sources and expect that that is going to provide a low entropy civilization. It does not work in that direction. So you see it picking at the edges of what we've built and it is coming apart. Well, Chris, I think that's a, that's a good place to dive into. Uh, you know, I've probably got about 10 minutes now to chat briefly about this development now with uh, Capital Energy and Ontario Power Generation uh, making an announcement about, I believe, a feasibility study for nuclear in Alberta. As you mentioned, an energy only market, um, which has proven to be very challenging uh, for nuclear, particularly we've seen um, a number of nuclear plants shut down for economic reasons in the US with the both the glut in low natural gas prices, but also renewables entry into energy only markets and, and the disadvan disadvantaging of, you know, these low entropy uh, baseload sources of electricity like nuclear. Um, let's just have a quick chat about that. I think we're gonna have to expand in a, in a further episode, but just in terms of taking in the uh, the news of the day, as it were. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about this announcement um, and and how it's being received and maybe how it fits. You know, it's just so so um, pertinent to me that the announcement's occurring as we're, you know, feeling a system strained with, uh, you know, these these um, high entropy sources that, that we've just been chatting about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Alberta has been flirting with nuclear power for a very long time. Um, and I mean, studies have gone back to very, very, uh, you know, deep parts of, of last century where uh, people were thinking about using uh, atomic uh, weapons, actually, to mobilize the, the bitumen resources underground. Is, I think it was part of Plowshare. They were investigating things like this. Um, none of those experiments ran up here to the best of my knowledge. Um, but uh, the fact remains, like, Saskatchewan, one of our neighbors, is is the Saudi Arabia of uranium on the on the planet. Uh, right next door, there is a lot of evidence in our drilling records and and drilling logs that uh, indicate a few regions that um, have uh, uranium deposits that may be able to be extractable within situ mining techniques. So that's really encouraging to think that Alberta might have um, something to contribute uh, in the future post fossil fuels, um, leaning on, on a resource like that or, or with friendly relations with our, our provincial uh, brothers and sisters, right? So that's that's exciting. And Alberta Energy, or sorry, Energy Alberta Corporation, Bruce Power looked at bringing in the, the twin ACR designs into the Peace River area, say 20 years ago, it's uh, time moves so fast. Uh, I'll get the actual years on our next talk, but that went away because largely, I think, of the um, inability to have a, a backup plan in the event of a trip. 
um, ACL didn't have smaller module sizes that they were marketing at the time, even though they had designs uh, that they could have offered, uh, just wasn't part of their mandate. So that sort of died. Um, and what's sort of unique and interesting about this scenario is uh, all the work that the province and industry has been doing, studying nuclear, uh, there's broadly, I think, a very high level of acceptance, if not curiosity, around nuclear power with um, the, the broad population in Alberta. Sure, there'll be some opponents and and that's fine. That's that's normal. But what we have here is uh, a unique situation where, uh, at least in my conversations earlier in trying to bring a small modular advanced reactor to, to the oil sands, uh, there was a lot of people saying, well, maybe, but there was some uncertainty around who might lead. And the province doesn't have very clear regulatory frameworks on how uh, such projects would be evaluated, reviewed, approved, regulated once they're built, and so on. Uh, there's kind of this sense that it's a federal jurisdiction, but in practice, there are contributions made from both the federal level and provincial levels of government. Um, there's no real presence of people that have built and operated such assets in this province by themselves. So uh, there's, there's a real challenge on that. And the, the players that are involved here fill in a lot of those gaps. Um, the, the government of Alberta is currently doing work to um, play part of the, the broader small modular reactor roadmap that's rolled out and being executed by the federal government. Uh, the oil and gas industry has a similar sort of roadmap called Pathways to Net Zero that contemplates the, uh, the use of small modular reactors if they're commercially available sometime in the 2040s. We have new regulations being um, issued at a federal level, level with the CER around emissions regulations that go over and above what Alberta already has in place for its own emission regulations. We're one of the only jurisdictions on earth that, that rolled uh, emission regulations out early and have functional commercial scale carbon capture and sequestration operating. So it's, it's this really strange dichotomy of people pointing their fingers at us because our numbers look terrible and, and they really are from that perspective, but we're doing quite a lot to try to change that and, and to break the barriers into figuring out something that will actually work at scale. And so capital power is uh, a utility that's based in Edmonton. Their generation assets are largely in that Northern half of the province. They uh, participated in a large number of those coal uh, repowering projects to gas. Um, I should note that the lifespan of those repowering projects are somewhat limited. I believe they're only on the 20 to 25 year sort of horizon. So as they were repowering those, you know, five or so years ago, they've only got another decade or, or so left before they need to make another repowering decision. And if they're going to do that, why not look at putting um, a small modular reactor that could fit in a similar footprint utilize the same interties and, and grid connections, same workforce. Um, you know, it, it's just a different sort of fuel supply. And if the timing works out, if the uh, capital investment levels are uh, not totally terrifying to a group like uh, Capital Power, um, as, as they aren't, um, you know, they can, they can manage the scale of investment required to build a small modular reactor fleet. Um, the government is making good on their commitment to actually roll out a regulatory framework. And then now you've got this outside player that says, hey, we've got a ton of experience in actually operating these things and getting your workforce up to the point where it actually performs and we'll actually joint venture with you to, to get that done. I mean, that's a really compelling story. And I'm a deal curious person. So I would be part of that conversation if I could. And, and it really is um, encouraging to see the leadership at, at OPG and at Capital Power step up and say, well, why not us? I really love that attitude. And I think enough of the feasibility work has been done from a technical perspective and an economic perspective 
it's been done and redone. We know it could work at certain sizes and investment levels. I think what this is largely about is, is getting down to more detailed terms and conditions and, and what structures might be utilized to enter into joint venture arrangements and, and power takeoff agreements. It, it's an advanced stage of, of uh, negotiation. And um, I'm really encouraged to see uh, where it goes. I hope this one uh, actually uh, connects and, and we get to see uh, Alberta join the, the club. Um, I think it could be deeply integrative and, and nation building to, to see uh, something like this happen. Uh, it's very exciting, actually. We might, uh, might tone down some of the separation talks if uh, <laughs> we feel like we can actually get along with our, our, uh, our brothers and sisters in Ontario a little better through this. Right. And Saskatchewan. Right, right. It'd be great. I, I mean, it's, it's a joke I've been making um, vis a vis the United States, but you know, the Democrats and Republicans can find just about one issue that they can agree on, and that's become nuclear um, in the last uh, four or five years. Um, you know, it's, it has been interesting being here on Ontario and watching the federal and provincial cooperation on nuclear. Um, and with Alberta, obviously, there's lots of tensions over these clean electricity regulations, um, federal kind of imposition um, or the perceived imposition, um, things like electric vehicle mandates, carbon taxes. But here again, um, you know, the federal government has really come around on nuclear. Um, Alberta's warm to it. So it seems like an area where carbon targets, uh, emissions targets, um, et cetera, um, can, can potentially come together and align on a, on a technology that all sides are, are comfortable with. So, uh, very, very excited to see where this goes. Um, we've hit the one hour mark, Chris, this has been really a, a fabulous conversation. We've been sort of circling in each other's orbits on WhatsApp groups and things like that, but haven't yet had a chance to really have a virtual face to face or so I, I truly, uh, it's been, uh, wonderful and I'm uh, really looking forward to having you back in the not so distant future to, to dig a bit more into this, uh, broader, um, you know, energy conversation around peak cheap oil. And, and, you know, we've been zooming in really into some of the minutia of nuclear and, uh, a lot of the audience loves that, but I know <laughs> we also love some of this larger sort of theoretical, uh, positioning. So, um, really great to have found a, a guest like yourself to, uh, to plan some future mischief with. Absolutely. I'm looking uh, forward to, to the tomfoolery we get into, sir. And, uh, <laughs> want, want to have quite a few of these, uh, the more the merrier and uh, happy to come back. I think we've set the table for a really nice um, conversation around maybe how nuclear can, can hold hands well with renewables and, and help uh, a really complex energy market like Alberta decarbonize, not just its electric grid, but that big beast, that thermal grid. Uh, can't wait to dive into that with you. And thanks for having me on. It's great to be with you. Awesome, Chris. Absolutely. Take care. Okay. Bye for now.